Hi everyone. Um, welcome to Draft Broadcasts. Um, I hope you can all uh, see me and hear me. Um, I'm uh, Ned McConnell and I'm the curator at Draft and today we're going to be speaking to um, Shuana Spong, who is a visual artist and a performer. Um, say hi Shuana. Hi, hi Ned. Hello. Um, so this series of talks is a um, this series of talks is uh, in partnership with Performance Exchange, um, which kind of came out of uh, wanting to support uh, live practice during the lockdown um, and try and give it still some um, a bit of a platform and some visibility. Um, so Performance Exchange is an organisation that's trying to create some kind of cross-sector dialogue around performance and collecting and presenting performance as well. Um, these talks are all going to be archived. So we, we have a shared YouTube channel with Performance Exchange, um, which you can find through both of our websites. So I suggest going there. They're pretty regular sessions. On, day, on in terms of the day, so every Thursday. Um, the next one will be performance exchanges next Thursday um, and the time is still TBC. Um, and so just a little bit of information about um, this format. So Sri, Wana and I are gonna speak for about half an hour or so, and then we'll be able to take some questions. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a Q&A button. So if you've got any questions, you can just type them in there and then Shruana and I will um, we'll try and address as many as we can at the end. So that's the kind of housekeeping bit out of the way. So um, to get into things, how are you doing, Shruana? Yeah, good. Um, good. Yeah, hello everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird not to see people's faces. Uh, yes, it's a slightly strange format, I agree, but um, but it seems to be working quite well so far. Yeah. Um, so Shruana and I met, um, when did we meet? 2017, maybe? When you were doing a residency at Gasworks? Yeah, it was like, oh, it was 16, I think. It's 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then after that, we worked together on a, on a show in my previous position at Pump House Gallery called A Hook but no fish. Um, so we've known each other for a while, so I'm really um, happy that we can uh, have a chat. Um, and given that this, this particular format is trying to unpack performance a bit, I think maybe we start there. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk a bit about your first performance, which was called Bells for Hooves. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's, I work a, across different medium and so um the performance bells for who's was kind of the first performance that i did and um i kind of start i developed it when i was doing my masters at the pet spot um and then this is me performing it in berlin at the dad gallery um so for this performance basically um it's it kind of it's a kind of an endurance kind of performance where I go down on all fours and then I rise on demi points and when I rise I kind of bang the bells together um, and I kind of do this rising and falling for as long as I can until I physically can't do it anymore and there's this I guess the tireder I get there's this kind of moment where my body's shaking and the bells are shaking and this kind of the bell and my body is this kind of vibrating kind of unit. Um, when, yeah, and the, the pose and the costume is based on Nijinsky's Afternoon of a Fawn. Um, I come from a ballet background, so I, I studied ballet till I was 15, and ever since I was a kid, I was quite obsessed with Nijinsky and this kind of, um, just from images that I had. So this, the kind of pose is like based on this quite famous Nijinsky pose. Um, yeah, it's very simple, but. What, I mean, what was it that drew you to want to do a performance in your current practice? I know you said that you have a kind of background in ballet, but was there, 
was there something that happened at that particular point in your practice? Um, it was really, I mean, it's honestly as simply as a challenge from one of my tutors, Bernd Krauss, who was like, basically like made all of our class do a performance night. And I'd been working like, um, I had made films with myself in it. So one of my old films from like 2007, I'd made a bird costume and kind of performed for that, but that was for film. So this was kind of the first live and I just really enjoyed it. I think I, I enjoyed the challenge and I also weirdly, I enjoy performing in front of, in that kind of live element, um, which I think there's this kind of, I mean, maybe because I used to do ballet competitions when I was dancing and there's this, there's this real, um, there's this kind of moment when you step in front of an audience and it's not about performing to an audience, it's kind of, you're like with the audience and there's this kind of magic that happens where it's almost like time becomes quite elastic and you're, you're kind of in charge of that time. And it's hard to explain, but I, I really missed that. And I, yeah, so. And there's, um, cause, so there's, there's a couple, I guess, of different types of performance you do. There's, there's this, which is you performing as solo, but then you also have been developing a kind of, um, orchestra, I suppose, or an ensemble of instruments. Yeah. Um, and then you invite collaborators to play them. So this, these images are from um, a hook, but no fish. But the but the iteration that you showed in in New Zealand in twenty eight later in twenty eighteen, wasn't it? So this yeah. is the show that was at Pump House Gallery and then went to Govert Brewster in New Zealand. And this is a performance from that space. Yeah. So I. Um... My, so this is kind of a person, it's like a, it's a series of sculptures that I'm developing over time. It's kind of like my own personal orchestra, I guess. Um, and it kind of came from this, it's, it's based on the Balinese gamelan. And um, so my father is from Bali and in Bali traditionally, each village would have its own gamelan orchestra and but each village would have its own kind of a slightly different pitch. So you, you couldn't play one instrument from one village. You couldn't take one instrument from one village and play it in another village's orchestra. So I was really drawn to this idea of kind of place being inscribed by, or, or like place being described through sound and through community and through history. And I think, I guess this orchestra was my way or is my way of creating place. Um, growing up in New Zealand, I, I, I didn't go to Bali till I was 15. So I have this very strange relationship to place, um, I guess. And so for me, this was a way of, of kind of inscribing my own sense of place through these different instruments. And each instrument is kind of developed for different shows so that, they take on the kind of resonances of the of what I'm thinking about for each show at the time, and then each instrument is named after somebody. So, um, so for example, Chanel here in this image is playing instrument D, which was named after um, instrument D, and then in brackets uh, Vera. So it's named after um, my friend Vera May, who's um, yeah, who I, um, oh my God, I've just blanked. Ne uh, oh my God, so embarrassed. Curator, she's a curator. I forgot the word curator. <laughs> <laughs> well, we tend to be quite forgettable, so don't worry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, wow. Um, so she's a curator and a very good friend of mine, and we have this kind of ongoing conversation. So this instrument is named after her. And so it's this kind of, so place as well as being about kind of conversation with people. Um, yeah, I, I feel like in your, in a lot of your practice or in certainly in some of your film works and some of your performance as well, I think there's, 
there's often a kind of like intertwining or interweaving of um of personal and cultural narratives yeah i think i mean my work often starts from exp from an experience um i'm i draw from experiential knowledge and then i I spend time researching. So it's this kind of, I try and find the space between um, a bodily experience um, and encounter and, and research. Um, and yeah, this, I mean, this work is, is very much about this kind of sense of kind of being dislocated, like um, estrangement from my Indonesian culture or my, you know, my family in Indonesia and the sense of kind of growing up dislocated from this part of me, mm. you, you have to create your own sense of place. Um, you have to kind of, yeah, you kind of, you, yeah, I don't know. It's and um, and in, in this performance, you've got, um, you're working with these collaborators. Mm. Maybe you can talk a bit about this because I feel like with this show, because it was in New Zealand, you had kind of access to lots of people that maybe you hadn't worked with for a while, but have known for a long time. Yeah. So this is a New Zealand band called Takulis. And Tina, who's um, kneeling on the ground, she's a really dear friend of mine. Um, and she, so we kind of met when we were teenagers in Auckland and she was in this like punk band and she was amazing. And I was kind of terrified of her. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of, and then we kind of, we never actually played together, but we're in the same scene. I guess I was in a band called The Pussies and, um, our band, we were all, each one of us was mixed heritage. Um, and so we were kind of, I guess, bouncing around the same scene together. And so it's, it was just, it's been really amazing to have them play these instruments. And what was really cool, I guess, is, you know, we'd spent, um, Tendai, the curator and I had spent, you know, like the week carefully installing these instruments. And then um, the coolies on driving down had kind of decided amongst themselves that they weren't going to treat them like art objects. They were going to treat them like they would treat their instruments, but they didn't tell me that. And um, <laughs> so it was quite amazing. So when they started the prompts, they kind of pulled the instruments together and, um, and kind of just banged away at them, these scratch marks on like the gong and so, but I think it's awesome. I mean, I think that's what these instruments are for. And I kind of really love this moment of passing these objects on to the performers to use how they want to use. Mm. Um, yeah. Like I'm quite particular, like I don't allow the audience members to play them. And it has to be people that I invite. And because yeah. these- yeah, I do remember, I remember at Pump House, we. The gallery assistants played the gong right at a certain, yeah. at a certain point during the day yeah so that was kind of that was the first time actually so that was instrument c clear and it's a bell plate and it was named um it's an homage to claire duncan who does a lot of the sound in my films she's a new zealand um is, that, is it that one is it? it's that one that's yeah, yeah that's the bell and um, it has these, every time it's installed, these branches are kind of installed with it. So it um, distorts the sound and you get the kind of leaves shaking and the branches scratching. Um, but yeah, this got played throughout the show on a particular kind of schedule at the pump house. And I wanted a way of the instrument being activated throughout the show. Yeah. Um, um, so, I guess moving moving on a little bit in terms of um, in terms of you like you're more, more holistically in terms of your practice, I suppose. There's I think in in a lot of your film works, um, which are often quite um, 
on the um, and the body. You think a lot about the body in terms of the f and, and the camera and the film and the kind of apparatus. Oh. Um, I wonder if we can talk about that, but maybe um, we'll just show a quick clip from Crystal Castle before we talk about that. Um, sorry, bear with me. This is where I have to be, try and be more technical than I probably am. <laughs> too much of our talking time. Um, so yes, I mean, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the body and performance and how that translates into your, into your film work as well. Mm. Well, yeah, I, with, I've done, I guess I've made a few works where my body performs and I film it. Um, so that one in particular, this film um, is based on Teresa of Avila's book, The Interior Castle, so the 16th century mystic. And the book's this kind of, Chris David calls it this kind of moving idiom where like, as you move through the book, you also move through her body. And I wanted to not make a film about the book, but I wanted to make the film as I read the book. So it's kind of like a moving, or a thinking with the book. And as I was reading it, this image kept coming to mind of this kind of crawling along this kind of strip of land. And yeah, I kind of went with it. So me and my friend Alice, who's Alice Walter, who's an artist, we drove up to this beach in Wales and um, filmed that segment. And I still don't quite know why or, um, why I was doing it, but I kind of realized afterwards, so she's quite a hard taskmaster. Like she made me do it about <laughs> 10 times. It was crazy. And by the end of it, I was so exhausted. I was wet, I was so cold, but there's, there's kind of a bit of a story around this segment. I mean, should I go into it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I started filming on the 16 mil film, uh, on a six, my Bolex and Basically with filming with film, I just wanted to kind of document the scene. That was kind of the idea because with, with film, you, you kind of, you have a certain amount of film and that's it. So it would have been like one take and that was it. So we started rolling and then we were kind of on the speech all on our own. And then over the crest of the kind of sand dunes comes a stag party of like 18 guys. And they kind of stopped. They just, like, we're talking about a massive stretch of beach, no one on it. And these dudes decide to stop, like, right behind where we're filming. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, no fucking way. And they kind of pull out their beers. They set up their cricket kind of game. And then they start wandering down. They come to the camera. They're like, oh, what are you doing? And then and I'm kind of in this uni tart. And I'm just, like, and kind of wet and, like, shaking. I was like, oh man, and Alice is like, do you, like, do you want to move and we can go somewhere else? And I was like, do you know what, like, fuck it. I was like, we were here first. I was like, I guess we just have to put on a show. So I'm kind of crawling on my hands and knees. She's 
operating the camera, these guys are watching. And I was, I kind of felt like this, you know, like a stripper to stag do or something, but, and then, and I was so stressed out. And then in the middle of all this, my Bolex breaks. So I'm kind of on the stage in the centre with these like 18 guys watching with this, trying to fix this camera. And there was nothing I do. So we decided to go with my digital camera, which I just bought actually as a light meter, thank goodness. But what I realized is because we had the digital camera, we could take more takes, we could okay. keep going. Mm. And Alice, Alice really went with that. So instead of just, so then it became a real performance because then it really became about kind of me and the environment and, and the kind of pain and the cold and the exhaustion and the 18 men watching and but we kind of were able to take endless takes and the I ended up using the last one so I think we did it 10 times and then when I got back and kind of had a shower and took off this kind of uni side I just had like bruises like my legs were just like bruised and I and then I kind of remembered I was like you know there's those like crawling pilgrimages like I felt I'd actually just kind of gone through this quite difficult physical thing that had left kind of bruises and marks but somehow yeah it kind of felt like a little pilgrimage to get that shot I guess yeah yeah <laughs> and also I guess having that unexpected audience changes your I guess changes your mental attitude towards what you're doing yeah I mean it, it makes you really dig in like I, I feel like when you're doing it just with a camera and you, there's not really that tension, but actually having people, having this audience made me really dig into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's, you know, this kind of element of defiance, which I actually think the piece really needed. Um, and and yeah. I guess this idea of like, the camera being an extension of the body as well, is something that, we've talked a bit about before and certainly appears in in other bits of your work I wonder what you think about in terms of the, like these kind of shots where you're obviously working with someone and you're appearing as a as a, a protagonist or a character or, or, or a performer and then some of the other pieces that you've made where you're holding the camera but also kind of performing within the film as well so something like um is it the creature or painter taylor the creature uh, this creature yeah so i'm just going to show a really short clip of that as well because i think that describes what i'm talking about really really well This creature, a woman of many voices, like a broth, like a potion, like a cure. This is not written in order, each thing after another, as it was done, but just as the story came to the creature in her mind, when it was to be written down. It is clear that she did not write this narrative, so who is the author? She is the main subject, protagonist and source. However, she did not write it, and it is unclear how much she controlled or approved of this text. Autobiography is a rigid term for such a collaborative way of writing. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, you know, the, I feel like there's a couple of different ways that you um, approach your filmmaking. And one is from a very um, sort of autobiographical way of looking at things but I also think you embody characters from, from often from the from the research that you you've done and then and then this idea of kind of 
embodying the camera or giving a a point of view experience for the for the viewers maybe you can talk a bit about that approach yeah well this creature um is is kind of came from reading Madri Kemp. She was a British mystic and she's kind of known as having written the first autobiography in English. Um, I made the work when I was at Gasworks in residency. Um, and that, yeah, that work, I guess, I wasn't, I'd, I'd applied for the residency and, and in my proposal, I'd wanted to um, actually see the, the oldest manuscript in the British Library. So, but I was kind of denied access um, because I didn't have a certificate in touching old things or something. Like, I think you need a special like, degree to touch old things. But, um, so I was thinking about touching and not being able to touch and being touched. Um, and I guess these, these women is kind of, you know, being touched by something else, by, by what they call God or nature or, um, and the, the, then these kind of diagnoses that are made about them is kind of postmenopausal or epileptic or um, the, I guess the way their experiences are kind of discounted through kind of diagnoses made of them years later. Um, but yeah, this kind of idea of being inhabited by another voice or, um, so yeah, like, I guess I grew up kind of around this idea. Like, um, I grew up in kind of with like, uh, in fundamental Christianity. So that's the whole thing. But my mum speaks in tongues and she actually has a translator. So this person who translates what? she says and so i kind of grew up around this kind of idea of speaking something else um i'm no longer in fundamental christianity by the way i feel like i need to kind of make that quite clear um but so yeah this work i was i kind of went around i was thinking about touching and just it was just came from a really dumb idea i was because i was kind of thinking well a mystic wouldn't take selfies, they'd take touchies. I don't know, it was really stupid, but then I, so the film is me going around Hyde Park, touching things and touching sculptures, um, touching birds. Um, and the iPhone's so great because it allows you to kind of film in this very simple way. Um, but what I kind of had to do for that is I gave myself, like I made myself touch the same object for two minutes. So there were moments where I actually had an audience as well doing that. But so two minutes is kind of long enough. So the first 30 seconds is like really embarrassing and, and two minutes is long enough to actually get into kind of forgetting the embarrassment and move into this kind of experience of the surface of the object. Um, yeah, and I guess I was interested as well in this kind of public-private kind of space where Hyde Park, it would seem, obviously it's like owned by the Crown, but the Crown allows the public to kind of wander through. Yeah. Um, and and um, I wonder, because you've, you've, a lot of your research has been into medieval mystics. You've done a lot of research into that area. Um, I wonder if you could maybe talk a bit about your relationship with them like you know how what do you because you because you also have written about them and um you know have done kind of academic study on them as well and i'm interested in this idea of talking backwards in time to people mm. or trying to have a conversation with those people in the same way i guess that um perhaps philosophers do in terms of you know they might be studying heidegger or whatever and they they might see that as really as a kind of conversation with people who are dead and uh you know from a long time ago yeah i think yeah i mean i i'm really drawn to these writers medieval mystic women from like you know like 
I've, I kind of, when I encountered them, it was, it was quite, it was kind of like encountering a form that I'd been looking for. Um, I f so with, with these mystic texts, they kind of really, they're very somatic and they start with experiential knowledge because these women were shut off from the institutions of learning. So they kind of had their, really, they only had their experience to work with. Um, and then also, but you know, you have um, Miss Six Eight Hildegard of Bingen, who also were able to learn a bit of Latin and did kind of, you know, wrote books about plants and obviously observing, she was observing things around her very specifically. And um, so you have this kind of mix of within these writings where what we would call separate genres kind of collapse and move around and you have like autobiography, fiction, um, ob observed knowledge that's come from observation, um, knowledge that's come, has come from experience, all kind of like within the same text. And then you also have these really wonderful moments of kind of elation and ecstasy and then doubt. Um, and for me, they really like reading them they, the form just felt very familiar to me in, in the way that I think or... Um, and then I also think, they, they, I find them really emancipatory as well. Um, but yeah, so I guess I've been studying them really as a way of, or as a form for making film, my films. Um, yeah. So I think the film Having Seen Snake, which mm -hmm. is there, was kind of came from this experience that I had in a graveyard in Pittsburgh where um, I encountered a snake, but it was this kind of very kind of crazy experience where, and I've tried to put it into words so often and where it was, it was like, before I saw the snake, my body went very, very still. And it was almost like it was this moment where language just disappeared and this kind of primal kind of primordial, primordial kind of life instinct kind of leapt forward mm -hmm. and everything kind of went white and um, sound became very heightened. And then there, there was this kind of moment where I felt language re into the situation and I was like, and that's when separation happened because I was like me, snake, I'm kind of panicked. So yeah. um, I, set up to make this film but I was kind of like well I want to I want to make a film that combines this kind of almost surreal poetic translate this kind of unspeakable experience onto film and then contrast it or bring on the same timeline a more documentary um, style of film and put them together on the same timeline. Um, yeah should we show a little clip of that? Yeah. And then we can uh, perhaps open it up to questions. And so then there's like, 
this yeah. other part of the film, which is more kind of documentary, right? Yeah. Yeah. The first one that was it was an amazing Sorry, discovery. Sorry, go on, Romana. Oh, I, was, I forgot Jose was speaking over this, but let's just listen to a little bit of Jose speaking and then I can yeah. explain. Okay. These things that you are walking around at night and you find this beautiful snake and you are like, wow, what is this? Uh, that was in the, in, in the Purus River in, in Peru, which, which is one of the most well-preserved and remote areas of the Amazon. So I had in the database written um, Dorso Coralinus, which is the name of the most similar species. Because at the beginning we thought, okay, this could be this species. Because we just checked quickly in the internet and we saw pictures of the Venezuelan species that look similar. So we thought, okay, this is it. But then when we read the description of this Dorso Coralinus, we found out that the habitat was different, that there were uh, clear differences. And that's when when we thought, oh, okay, this is new. So this is, um, yeah, when I was thinking through this project, I, um, I happened, I was in Pittsburgh and I was introduced to Jose Padiel, who is a herpetologist. And we were talking about this kind of snake encounter and on his desk he had this jar with this snake in it and it, I was like, I, was, I kind of asked him what it was and he he goes to the Amazon twice a year to discover, um, to find species that haven't been discovered yet. Um, for him it's kind of political because the more species you can find in an area, the more chance you have of protecting that area. But anyway, this was a snake that he just discovered and he was in the process of naming it. So I I was kind of looking at this entity that hadn't yet been pulled into English language, it hadn't been pulled into culture, uh, you know, Western culture, it hadn't been pulled into science. Um, and it was, yeah, it was quite, so then the rest of the film was kind of an interview with Jose about the process of naming, naming something, um, what it is to pull something into language. Yeah, yeah. And so the first part is kind of this like not being able to speak about something, this unnaming of an experience, and then it kind of moves into naming. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so we'll, we can open it up to questions now and see uh, if anybody's got anything they want to ask. So, like I said earlier, there's a little QA button at the bottom. If you click on that, then you can type in any questions that you have. We didn't get to the rat. We didn't get to the rat, no. <laughs> True. Well, Maybe we can, we, cannot, we can talk about that in a minute. Um, so Daria de Bouvet uh, says, could you say again the title and date of the last film shown? So that is Having uh, Seen Snake. Uh, hey Daria. <laughs> um, it's having, having hyphen seen hyphen snake. And it's 2016, yeah. Um, the title comes from a George Saunders interview. Um, where in the White Review where he talks about this very same experience. Um, and how you can write about this energy that you have when you encounter a snake. And I read it basically the day after this thing in the cemetery happened. So he calls it having having seen snake energy, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, it, it's, it is such a great um, kind of description of something because I really, like, I've never really come across a snake per se, but I can totally like understand what it would feel like you know that mm -hmm. that there would be a sort of yeah bodily take takeover of of the normal psychological functions i suppose in order to try and protect you yourself or something yeah i mean absolutely like it was kind of this moment where it was like my body jumped ahead of my mm. consciousness and like literally language fell out 
it was kind of, but you know, I've never had ex an experience like that really where you feel language kind of re-enter the scenario. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Um, so just while we wait for some more questions coming, maybe we can talk about the rat's nest. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just because, yeah, I only brought it up because I feel like that's the image that we've been using for the talk. Yeah, true. But, yeah, so I guess that was like my second performance. And, um, and that kind of came from watching, I, I was on a dad residency in Berlin and I'd moved into this apartment and I noticed like within a week of moving in on the windowsill outside my bedroom was this rat building a nest. And at the time I was quite lonely, like I'd kind of moved from Rotterdam when I'd been doing my masters to Berlin and I didn't really know that many people. So I kind of kept watching this rat. And I kind of was, and then I was thinking at the time about kind of like, I guess, fear and otherness and why are these creatures, why do we fear these creatures or why are they kind of disgusting to us? And the performance came from this and um, I, st I kind of thought about the rat as like, kind of, you know, like tassiography, like teacups leaving a message yeah. and it's kind of nest as this kind of message of leaves. So I, each day we kind of pull out leaves, um, wearing gloves and photograph them and then did a kind of, kind of prophecy for the future based on these leaves from the rat's nest. But it's quite, it's kind of, it's kind of, it, it's, yeah, it was, it was kind of a speculative kind of prophecy. It talks about fear and, um, at the time I'd had a letter from someone close to me warning me about the end times and Armageddon and you know so that kind of comes into it as well <laughs> yeah so we have a question from Lalu Del Braccio mm. who says when working with a live audience how do you think you can create a state of observation um, Lalu, what, what do you mean by a state of observation? Can you just clarify that? Do you, it's interesting, is that the performer observing what's happening themselves? It's an interesting question. What do you think, Ned? Do you think it means um, a state or like holding the audience's attention maybe? Yeah, or? I mean, it's hard because I don't like, I f you know, I feel like there are performers, you know, like I feel like I dabble in performance. Oh, okay. Ah, right, so, okay. Yeah, so she says, this is following the mystics of the 16th century. We said knowledge comes from observation and experience. I feel like um, there's a difference, I guess, between, for me, the, the act of the work or the performance and the world that goes on in the making of the work or the performance. So I feel like the, like the work for me starts from observation or experience and then it goes through this process of research and then the work's made and I feel like in the performances, it's, I guess if you're observing anything, it's this, I think I talked about it before, this kind of elastic moment of time where you really, you feel like you're in the space with other bodies and you're all in the kind of this presence together and but because you're performing you're in charge of of the energy in that space and I'd say that's really all I'm observing when I'm performing um, yeah I'm not sure if that answers your question but I think it's I mean it, it must be I guess as a performer you're trying to be quite in in that moment and uh i guess the observation may, would potentially come be kind of post performance 
you would think back to what the performance was like. But when you're in the performance, I guess that state of observation is is not really something that you're necessarily um, concentrating on, maybe? No. I, yeah, I mean, I guess it's, it's, I mean, it's interesting because it's not observation in terms of looking, but I think your body is observing the energy in the space. So there is actually this observation that's happening in the body because that's what you're responding to. Um, like you can feel if people are bored, you know, and you can feel if people are drawn into it. Um, and, and then I think also it's always really nice to, about the observation that happens afterwards and conversations with other, pe other people about how they have observed it and that can shift. So the first performance I did, the Nijinsky one, when I was developing it, I thought it was really funny. Like, I thought it was kind of a funny performance. And then when, after I performed it in Berlin, I had three different women come up to me and, you know, be like, that was so intense and it was quite emotionally devastating to watch and right. I was like oh and by this by the third person I was like was it funny at all and she was like no <laughs> <laughs> and you know and they in some way their observation of the work helped me to observe what was how the work was actually functioning yeah I mean I think with performance it's um it's always interesting to see like because the context of the audience is always going to be important to performance because it's lots of, because of the live nature of it so what they bring to the table i suppose in terms of that transmission of a, of, of a performance is is always going to um yeah change things quite radically i suppose potentially mm -hmm. so lucy is asking um is it partly through the desire of creating your own sense of place that you move from ballet dance to visual art? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. I, I mean, purely visual art has given me the ability to do that definitely. And especially coming from two very strict disciplines, coming from fundamental Christianity and coming from ballet, two very strict kind of um, dogmas, really. Visual art was like this, like, yeah, this incredible kind of way that I was, I mean, visual art is amazing for freedom in terms of, yeah, creating your place, creating who you want to speak to and how you want to speak. But on a purely, like, I stopped doing ballet because I had terrible turnout. I wasn't going to be a ballet dancer. <laughs> <laughs> well it's good that it's made its way into your practice in some way so you know it's still there it's still there yeah yeah um all right unless there's any more questions which i don't think there are um we i guess we'll finish up there unless there's anything else you want to um to say or touch on Trona? no i mean i should also i guess just very briefly because it hasn't come up but i should also mention that i I spent a lot of time collaborating with a dancer, Benjamin Ord, who's a New Zealand dancer, and I learned a lot from working with him as well. Um, but he hasn't, it hasn't come up naturally, but I did want to kind of um, yeah. say that, yeah. Great, all right. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely as always to talk to you. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully see you again soon. Yeah, thank you, Ned. All right. Um, take care. Thanks yeah, so much. Too. Thanks Bye. so much. Bye. Bye. <laughs>